we just uh, came in today honestly. I'm like, God, I I don't want to do today. <laughs> I want I want to skip it. But uh, who who knows that sometimes it's in our worst days that God has the greatest encounters with us. Um, it's been when I felt my worst and I've had my greatest encounters with God. Um, they're the most memorable. They're the most transformative. And so I want to encourage you, if, you, if you're woke up today, you're like, I don't want to do today. Um, I'm proud of you for doing it anyway. I'm proud of you for doing it anyway. Kicking off the blankets, putting some shoes on, and coming to church was a great way to start it. Um, I don't know what today is going to look like, to be honest. I have all my notes here. I get to Pastor Chris, and I got to talk to him early. And I said, you know, we're going to figure this out together <laughs> because um, I've got a lot of stirring in my spirit. So uh, if you want to mind praying with me today, pray pray with me, but listen, because I know that God wants to speak a word, and, and the enemy does not want the word to be heard. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and pray, and, and while we're doing that, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 5 as well. Lord, we just praise you and we thank you. And, and right now, Lord, I pray that any and all distractions of the enemy, any and all distractions of life, God, any, anything that would speak to our heart or mind or our spirit today that I just don't want to do today, Lord, right now we give it to you. We place it at your feet. We, we give it to you as an offering. And God, I thank you because you are the only king who would take our junk and receive it as a blessed offering. You're the only one who would do it. And so, Lord, today I give you my junk. I give you my weightiness. I give you the, the tired sum. I give you the, the sinuses. I give it all to you, Lord. The restlessness, the, the weariness, it's, it's yours. But, God, I also want to give you my best and my all. So this morning, Lord, just take all of us. Take all of it. The good, the bad, the ugly, the great. Use it, Lord, and, and minister your word today as clearly as you can. Minister it with might and with authority, with anointing and power. We make ourselves available to you, Lord, and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 5. Last week, um, I didn't get a chance to, to watch all of it yet, but um, I look forward to digging into it more. But last week, we got into the first few ch verses of Acts 5, and we're going to pick up there. We're going to pick up right after the loving rebuke that Ananias received from Peter. Who here is happy that you received the Lord's rebuke without dying every time? I, I would have lived a few more than nine lives at this point if I died every time the Lord gave me a rebuke. But Ananias has just heard the Lord's rebuke in verse 5, and it says this, And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last breath. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Other translation says that he was covered. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? I think that that question alone could probably take up a year's time worth of preaching. How often have we agreed to test the Spirit of the Lord? He says, How have you done this? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last breath. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. There's a lot to unload in this scripture portion. And if any of you remember, about two years ago, I went through about four weeks of this story alone in the Bible. And there's more I could probably still go into. And I could probably continue this another four or five weeks. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. Not this time. But what God has put on my heart, if you're taking notes, today's word 
whether it be what I originally intended or, or go somewhere else, the message is titled, What's Covering You? What's Covering You? Because I think it's a question that we all need to ask ourselves on a regular basis, daily. In fact, Scripture emphatically reminds us constantly that we should daily walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. We should daily walk this thing out. Daily repentance would be a good idea for a believer. Daily pursuit, daily intimacy, daily holiness. And the thing is, is that we cannot be intimate without holiness. And we cannot be holy without intimacy. We cannot be who God has created and designed us to be without intimacy. And if we're not asking the question, God, what's covering me? I don't really know that we can be as intimate as we need to be. I don't know about you, but I, I've been in times in my life where if I was honest, it wasn't God who was covering me. I had anyone and everyone else covering me but God. So this morning, I want you to encourage yourself in the Lord, but also accept the correction of the Lord of what's covering you. And maybe, maybe just maybe this morning, instead of you physically dying, you would let that area of your life die so that the Lord can breathe life into it instead. What's covering you? You know, we are going to follow the notes. That's where we're going. So the first thing, if we want to understand about this question, is that we need to understand first and foremost that we are all constantly and always being wrapped up in something. We're wrapped up in something all the time. It's going to happen. Even, even Scripture tells us that even in our freedom, that it comes as being slaves to Christ. We're wrapped in something at all times. It comes with the cost, freedom itself. And sometimes we get this naive or deceptive view that we are running free, unwrapped. But we're not. There's something that's covering us, wrapping us up at any given time. Like I said this last week, we went to Colorado and, and had very different ideas of what vacation was going to be like. It was good. It was still good. We got to be with very, very close friends that are like family to us. And we got to be there. But who knows, sometimes the greatest blessing you have is to be able to be there for and minister to somebody when they need it most. And that's what it was. Our vacation, we thought was going to be wrapped up in the mountains all week. We thought it was going to be wrapped up enjoying the scenery all week. Was wrapped up in loving some brokenhearted people. It was wrapped up in, in being available to hearing cries from people who normally don't cry. It was being available to just hear the heart spew its pain when they had nowhere else to do it to. It was being able to carry them in a season they need carried in. We were wrapped up in some heavy, some heavy hurts last week. But we got to do it with God. We are still wrapped with Him. So we're always wrapped up in something. And I want us to understand that because when we can accept that simple point, they are able to kind of break it down a little bit in, in asking some deeper questions. So in Psalm 91 verses 1 through 4, if, if you don't read this scripture on a daily, I encourage you to start. And I also encourage you to realize that as great as all the promises are, they are all contingent on the first part of this chapter. But in chapter 91, verse 1 through 4, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So what is the contingency for every promise that's about to follow? He who abides in the shelter of the Most High. What does that mean? I'm being covered by the presence and the Spirit of God. I'm being covered in time with Him. I'm being covered in intimacy with Him. I'm being covered in, in, in relationship with Him. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Continue on for me. For He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, other translations say pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. So 
It continues on with incredible promises and blessings to follow those who would dwell in the shelter of the Most High. But in here, go ahead and go back to that second portion for me in verses 3 through 4. Because I want to point out in there, it's highlighted. But I want you to see what, what we're pointing out is that we are clearly demonstrating that there are two ways that we will be covered or wrapped up in this world. We'll either be wrapped up with the snare of the enemy or we will be covered by the feathers and the wings of the Lord God Almighty. We're always being wrapped up in something. And so I want to help us differentiate the differences between the wrappings, between the coverings of God and the enemy. You can take that down for me. I want us to understand why we need to understand the differentiation. Because it helps us understand our promise. Scripture tells us that it is the goodness of God that draws us to repentance. So if we never showed the world how good God was, they would never see a need for relationship with him, right? That's how it works. If we didn't share it, they wouldn't know it. And so I want you to see the difference in these wrappings or these coverings. God's covering in our lives, as we see in Scripture, is a refuge and a protection to us. When we operate within the covering of God, then we are operating within his protection. We're operating within his refuge. We saw that in Psalm 91, but we all see in Psalm 5, verse 11. He says, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may exalt in you. There's this incredible protective refuge of our lives when we desire and we walk in the covering of God. Protection from what? Protection from what? From the enemy. Protection from his prowling. Protection from his, his snare, as we read in, in, nine, in Psalm 91, because the truth is that Satan's covering operates more as a snare of death. We have a protective refuge from God, where we have a snare of death from the enemy. These are the difference in the coverings or the wrappings that we can receive from, from God or Satan. But in 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter talks a little about this enemy. He says, be sober, mindful, and watchful. He's talking to the church. We need to be sober-minded. We need to be clear in thinking. We need to be alert in watching. He says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Do you know that the enemy can't devour anybody unless they've been trapped first? Can't do it. His entire goal to get us convinced to be wrapped up in his snare is so he can stop us long enough to devour us. How has the church, how has a godly person ever fallen into the snare of the enemy? Because they weren't alert. They weren't sober-minded. They weren't conscious. They weren't intentional about walking in the protective refuge of the Spirit of God. They weren't dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. They weren't dwelling if we look in the Old Testament temple, what would happen? You see the temple is broken up into three main areas. There's the outer court, which is a place of fellowship and gathering. Then there was the inner court, which took place with the teachings and the, and the deeper sacrifices and givings. And then there was the Holy of Holies. Thank God that we're not separated out of that anymore. But there was a time and a season when the Holy of Holies was only allowed for the high priest and he had better been cleansed really well before he went in. Because what they do is they tie a rope around his waist with bells. And as long as the bells were moving, good news. Good news. The priest was still alive. But if the bells stopped moving, that meant that he wasn't clean enough to be in the presence of the Holy of Holiness of God. He'd fall dead and they'd have to pull him out of the curtain room. True story. That's how it worked. But what's interesting about this is Scripture now tells us we are a temple of God. We are a temple of God. We've got our outer room. We've got our inner room. We've got the intimate Holy of Holies. So what happens whenever we as a people remain in the holiness of God? 
What happens if we remain in the secret place? If we would dwell in the shelter of the Most High, if we would dwell in the Holy of Holies, the enemy couldn't touch us. Because evil cannot be where the holiness of God is. So we call to be covered by, to walk in the protection and the refuge of God. It is to protect us from the snare of the enemy because he's seeking to devour us. Unfortunately, I don't even like talking about these things, but they have to be talked about because otherwise the church looks like it's turning a cheek and ignoring the evilness that happens. But another pastor associated with Hillsong this week is now under major scrutiny. Because after they had their version of counsel and meetings, he went out for drinks, got drunk, and was recorded to be in another woman's room for 40 minutes at a hotel. Why? He didn't dwell in the shelter. He didn't allow himself to be protected in the refuge of God. He allowed himself to step out of the courts, and he got trapped in a snare of the enemy. We don't know if anything happened beyond that, but the truth is he entertained the enemy a little too long. Why is the church sometimes taking a stance? It's, we've sometimes gotten the blow of being too legalistic. And it's true, but the heart was always at a place of remaining holy. Because if you don't just entertain it, the enemy doesn't have a hold. We have to come to a place where we, we, we follow holiness without legalism. We follow holiness without religiousness. But we follow it with conviction and with depth. The snare of the enemy is sent to devour us. Every time. Any foothold he can get, he'll take. And he will try to destroy us with every ounce he can. We have to understand that we're always being wrapped in something. Whether it be wrapped in the protective refuge of God or the snare of the enemy that's sent to devour us. The second thing we need to understand is that our covering is always taking us somewhere. It's always taking us somewhere. Where is it taking you? Because we see here that with Ananias and Sapphira, they were wrapped up in burial clothes, weren't they? It says they were covered and then they were carried out to the burial ground. Our covering is always taking us somewhere. But where is it taking you? Where is it taking you? We need to understand this. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus is speaking. He says, Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. There are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard. That leads to life, and those who find it are few. I want you to take note of the highlighted portion for a moment, because we see what we've been wrapped in is where it's carrying us. When we have been wrapped in the things and the lies of the enemy, we've been wrapped in the snare, we've been wrapped in the things that opposed the truth and the holiness of God, then we are being carried into a wide gate. We're being carried into destruction. When we've been wrapped in the things of God, it's narrow, it's hard, it's not easy. I get it, it's not easy. I've lost very dear friends from taking a stand for the word of God. Not easy. I've lost sleep. I've lost times with my family. I've, I've lost vacations. It's not easy, I get it. But where is it you're wanting to go? Where is it you want to go? Because you can't be covered with the snare of the enemy and go into the narrow gate. It can't happen. It can't happen. Satan's snare, that snare for devouring, it will always leave behind death and flesh. Every time. It will leave behind death and flesh. You know when a lion has attacked. It's pretty evident in the physical, isn't it? You can see when a lion or a pack of lions have devoured an animal because death and flesh was left behind. It's the same thing with the enemy. Whenever we have been covered by his snare, he has devoured us, he will always leave behind death and flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 and 21 puts it this way. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. As in it doesn't take a lot of guessing. I feel like the church has downplayed sin a little too much in our lives. 
We've downplayed holiness a little too much in our lives. And we're like, well, I don't know if that's sin or not. I don't know. It's up between God and you. He's a judge. I'm not. Scripture says it's pretty evident. It's easy to determine. It's easy to see. If these are the works and the actions within somebody's life, it is flesh. It is sinfulness. It is the, the trap, the snare of the enemy. Now, the works of flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. We could go into a, a lot of sermons breaking this down. I don't have the time for it, but what I'm going to challenge you is this. Study it. Study it. Know what those things really are and what they really mean. Don't just take it by a word surface, but dig deep. Why? Because if you are trapped in one of them, the following contingency to that word is simply this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I think eternity is worth studying for. I think your eternal displacement is worth understanding. Because I think sometimes we get caught up in living these things and accepting them, not really knowing what they are and not really realizing they're displacing us from a heavenly hope of eternity. Know what it is. Study it. Know it. Because these things are evident. If they're in your life, they are keeping you from eternal hope of Christ. They are keeping you from a heavenly reward. They are keeping you ensnared. And they are leaving behind evidence of flesh. And they are leaving behind evidence of death. And they are leaving behind evidence of eternal suffering. Understand it. Understand it and allow God to come up and rewrap you. Allow him to come back beside you. Because on the other hand, even though Satan's snare leaves death and destruction of flesh behind, God's covering leaves his fruit following. It's evident there's a difference between somebody who is leaving death and destruction in their wake and somebody who is leaving behind godly fruit in their wake. Because when we continue in the scripture of Galatians 5, 22 through 24, it picks up and it talks about how these are the acts of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And here's its catch. Against such things there is no law. What does that mean? When you live like this, when this is the fruit that follows, nothing can destroy you. Nothing can bring you down. Nothing can kill you. Nothing can break you. Nothing can separate you. Because against these things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus, what does it say? They have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If signs of the flesh are following you, you haven't crucified it. it. means there's an area in your life that you are keeping from Christ that doesn't belong to him. What you are wrapped in is going to dictate where you are taken. It will carry you. Where is your covering taking you? Where is it taking you? We're all wrapped in something. Our covering is taking us somewhere. The last thing we need to understand about that, though, is it always begins with death. It always begins with death. So what death are you being carried in? Ananias and Sapphira were not covered. They were not wrapped up. They were not carried out, and they were not buried until they were dead. There's stories of premature burials, and they do not end well. They don't end well because they always end the way they started, dead. We, we don't escape this thing called death. It's going to happen one way or the other, whether it's premature or not. And I promise you this. If you are being wrapped up and covered in the snare of the enemy, and you are leaving behind works of the flesh and death everywhere you go, you have prematurely died. You're already living a dead life. You're already walking away void of everything God has for you. 
what death are you being carried in? Romans 8, 13 says it this way. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. In fact, you are already dead. Don't even know it. But if the Spirit you put to death, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You see here, there's, there's a death response either way. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Caveat is truth. You already are dead. So if you live in the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the things of the flesh, you will live. There is a death that is taking place in each and every one of us every day. Every day. It is either we are waking up and we are crucifying our flesh with Christ all over again. Or we are allowing the flesh to put our spirit to death all over again. Death is going to take place. It has to take place. The question is, will we die prematurely? Or will we put to death the flesh that we could live forever? There's a promise with the death of the flesh. There's a promise with the death of our sinful nature. There's a promise that comes with the, with the death of our own personal nature that the world cannot give us. It's a promise that Satan cannot make for us. He can promise us eternity. But it's not an eternity any of us want. No matter how deceived we may believe, we don't, we don't want it. What death are you being carried in? Spiritual death comes when we prioritize fleshly life. When we prioritize this thing. When we prioritize the life we live based on what we see, based on what we feel, based on what we experience or touch. When we prioritize that, spiritual death takes place. Scripture tells us that the world we live in, the life we live, the life we experience is just a vapor in the wind. Here today, gone tomorrow. It has no substance. It has no real value in the scheme of things. It's come and gone. Unfortunately, a lot of us put more weight and time and value on this life than the eternal one to come. And we prioritize it. But when we do, we put to death our spiritual life. Romans 8, 6 says it this way. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. The moment our thoughts, our focus, our priorities, our way of living, our hopes, our values, the moment they are established on anything in this fleshly world. We have already died. We've already died. We've given over an eternal hope and reward in that moment. None of this matters. When Satan tempted Jesus, he said, If you will bow down before me, I will give you all of these kingdoms. I'm going to shock some theology. He wasn't lying. Jesus could have had all of that. Satan had it to give over. But Jesus realized that the eternal kingdom, the kingdom to come, the kingdom that would establish itself, would domineer and take authority over the kingdom that Satan had. He wasn't focused on the flesh. He wasn't focused on the here and now. His priority wasn't the flesh. So his spirit didn't die. Fleshly death comes from prioritizing spiritual life. I want to see that difference. Our spiritual death takes place when we prioritize fleshly life, but our fleshly death takes place, the sinful death, the sinful nature takes place when we prioritize spiritual life. Romans 8.10 says it this way, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, Right? Unless Jesus comes back before we die, none of us is escaping this thing alive, right? It's inevitable. So if but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The moment we put to death the need to prioritize this, 
to prioritize this. And we put that to death and we prioritize this. The eternity, the relationship, the intimacy, the hope of the Father. And we start prioritizing this, the people around us, and connecting to them and reaching out to them to have relationship with him. The moment that becomes priority, this thing dies. Scripture tells me that when I gave my life to Christ, I no longer was my own. I no longer have a will that counts. I no longer have a desires that matter. I no longer have wishes that need to be concerned about. Because what I did is I gave myself to Jesus and I said, Lord, I believe you are better than anything I could be. I believe in your foolishness. You can make wiser decisions than I can in my wisdom. I believe in your weakness. You can be stronger than I am in my strength. I believe that the worst of you is so much greater than the best of me. And I submitted to that. I submitted to that and said, I don't count anymore. I don't matter anymore. I am constantly a proxy vote for Jesus. That's all I am. I'm constantly a proxy for him. When he comes, when I come across a situation and he says, move, I move. When he says, speak, I speak. Why? Because I have understood. And there are moments I fall short. I'm not perfect in it. There are times I was silent when I should have spoken. There are times I was still when I should have moved. Times I moved when I should have been still. What did I have to do? I had to begin again. I had to go back to the secret place. I had to go back to the beginning and say, Lord, rewrap me. I need out of the snare. I need out of the snare. I need out of the, the place that I can be devoured by. Take me out. Bring me back in. Rewrap me. Retake me where you want to go. Remove in me. Help me die to this flesh all over again. And I come to that place of surrender. The enemy is constantly on the look. Unfortunately, Ananias and Sapphira were wrapped up in a snare. When we look at the end of chapter 4, it says that Barnabas sold his land and gave everything to the church. He gave everything to the people. He was wrapped up in the holiness of God. He was wrapped up in obedience of God. He didn't do it because he was told to do it by anybody but God himself. And he obeyed. Ananias and Sapphira were wrapped up in the trap of the enemy, seeking to devour them. And they never left it. They didn't leave the snare for the shelter of the Most High. They didn't leave the snare for the refuge. They stayed there. And it cost them everything. They were wrapped up in death's claws. Do you know when Jesus died on the cross and they placed him in the tomb, they wrapped him in death cloths. They wrapped him in claws that they give a dead man. Thankfully, those claws are empty. When we died to ourself, Scripture says that he took our death cloths off and he clothed us in righteousness. He rewrapped us. He recovered us. The things of death, those deathly claws, they need shed from our life. We can't pick them up and put them in the closet and remember what it was like when we used to be dead. We have to put them aside. We have to burn them up, leave them behind, and remember who we are covered by.